Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 20, We Are All Prey, featuring Joanna Pocock. Joanna Pocock is an Irish-Canadian writer living in London. Her writing has notably appeared in the Los Angeles Times, The Nation, and on the Dark Mountain blog. Her most recent book is entitled Surrender, and is a memoir that mostly focuses on her adventures in the western United States. There, as she experienced menopause, she explored the history and nature of the landscapes and met various rewilders, including the notorious Phoenicia Madrano. The book takes its name from an eco-sex convergence that she attended. Joanna and I talked on June 25, 2020. Using her book as a jumping-off point, we covered a variety of topics, including settler colonialism, rewilding, cultural appropriation, how sexuality changes with age, social media, cities, the challenges for youth in today's world, and finding home in a placeless society. In the background of all of these subjects was the environmental crisis, which alarms us both. Here we go. Joanna, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I read your book, Surrender. I picked it up yesterday and did not put it down until I was done with it. Oh, wow. Okay, uh, that makes me really happy. (laughs) I just read it cover to cover. Every single part of it was really interesting. It was also intriguing to me because I knew uh, several of the people that you were talking about in there, too, because I've met them or they're personal friends of mine. So that also held my interest. Interesting. Well, you're probably uniquely placed in that case because um, uh, I don't know how many people that are. I mean, I did. I sent a copy to our mutual friend, Phoenicia, who is sadly no longer with us. I don't know if she read it. I will probably never know if she read it. Uh, She certainly read parts of it um, that involved her and gave me her blessing on those. So um, I'm happy about that. And actually, Peter Michael Bauer did read the bits about him. So I sort of sent bits of the book as I was working on it to people that were in it so that uh, they didn't feel uh, they were represented unfairly. But that's something maybe we can talk about later. Or I don't know uh, if you want to talk about when we write about real people in our books and how that how that works out. Oh, that is definitely an interesting question. Yeah, I do. First, I think want to hit on just the what I felt like was the theme of, of surrender. Mm-hmm. And to me, it felt like the theme was we are prey. Right. Okay, so I, I got that right. You got it. Yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I think some some brains, I think a lot of people, you know, we're constantly looking for the answer for things. We're constantly looking, how can we fix this? How can we fix that? And I guess my brain is, 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 I don't know, made up in such a way that I'm always trying to sort of get to the essence of things. And I actually think the essence of so much of what is wrong is that humans refuse to accept that we are prey. And I think if we remember that in everything we do, uh, I think we would see a seismic shift in our sort of global consciousness, um, so to speak. So, yeah, I think it, I, I, I think, you know, human exceptionalism is really a big part of the rot. Yeah. And so in your adventures in the in the West, you had lots of opportunities to see how uh, humans are prey or how you yourself, you know, could be prey. Yes. I mean. Um, it, it's 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 interesting because the book emerged so organically. I mean, when my husband so just, so for people who don't know what surrender is, um, it's probably good if I just sort of 
say very quickly. So um, my husband and daughter and I left our home in East London and moved to Missoula, Montana. And the reasons we moved are all in the book. It was kind of a gut feeling. We just kind of had to get out of the city and um, we needed to seek, uh, we, we just, we were seeking another way of living, another way of looking at the world. So we ended up in Missoula, Montana and uh, I'm a writer. I was working on a novel and then I couldn't not write about what I was seeing around me. And what I was seeing around me was lots of land and some wilderness. Well, so-called, well, wilderness is a difficult term because it's actually not so wild anymore. But, um, and I was just really compelled to explore it and to really try and get under the skin of what I was seeing. Um, and the first thing I did was actually I took a wolf trapping course. It was like the very first kind of act I did. Um, because I'm extremely anti-trapping uh, any wild animals, but I thought, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm a guest in this place. I don't, I don't know Montana. I don't know how these people live. I, I can't speak for them. But if I'm going to write about something, I need to actually know what it is. So I did a wolf trapping course, and it just actually reinforced my feelings around trapping. Um, and uh, so that sort of set me, and I, and I just sort of kept notes and kept writing and. And then it eventually became a book, but I never set out to write a book. That's amazing because the themes do weave in and out so effectively of all the different, all the different stories. Yeah. And I think this again comes to this idea of seeking some kind of essence and, and you know, what, when you scratch the surface of the West, I mean, I was, I was kind of, I was amazed, you know, you'd be sort of hiking and everyone would be looking at the river. You go, oh, it's such a beautiful river. And oh, look at these beautiful mountains. And, and I was always like picking away at the scene, picking, picking. And, you know, what do you get when you scratch the surface of these beautiful landscapes in Montana? You get mining and extraction and you get genocide. And, and ranching. And ranching. And ranching, right, which is a form of extraction in a way, um, in that it's just taking from from the earth. And I couldn't shake those uh, thoughts from my head. And I think that's partly why, you know, every time I sort of sought out someone who could tell me something about land in the American West, um, yeah, it, it, you know, somehow, somewhere along the line, we would end up talking about, yeah, extraction, as you said, ranching, um, you know, the stolen lands from uh, First Nations, Native American people. And um, so, yeah, those themes run, run through because I, I didn't feel that I could really look at any of the West without confronting those things and actually I, I say to friends you know uh, in a way the book is sort of menopause meets mining <laughs> <laughs> um, you know because it is very personal but it is also very political yeah I myself uh, moved to the west in early in the year 2001 to Portland Oregon and uh -huh. I was fortunate enough to meet some forest defense activists right away so oh, I got to go out to the old growth forest right away, et cetera, you know. And then since then, I've traveled around the West quite, a, you know, quite a bit. And I had a lot of the same observations and the same uh, epiphanies or conclusions that you did, you know, namely that it's this big, beautiful place that's being, you know, raked over. And that it was stolen so recently and you right. can still feel that theft, you know? Right. Because I lived on the East Coast for a little while too, like in Boston. Mm -hmm. And I remember writing a poem when I was in, in Boston about the other underneath, I believe it was called. And the other in this case was, you know, what I think I would now refer to as maybe the great mysterious, you know, or something like that, you know. But what I felt in Boston was that whatever was was spiritual or transcendent or whatever about the land there was so buried, you know, was yeah. so you, you, you could not detect it. You couldn't feel it in everyday right. life, you know, like you could lay down on the ground, put your ear on the ground. You wouldn't hear it because it's just 
everything back east has been so buried for so long. And I've also been to Europe and, and you know, it was, it was years ago and it was before I was thinking about such things, you know, but I, it strikes me that Europe is even more so because there's even, I mean, there's, there's so very little there of what one would call wilderness. Right. And actually that, that was something I think, I mean, it's interesting because I grew up in Canada and then moved to, to London sort of via New York for a while. Um, moved to London when I was about 24 and I've been here ever since apart from our time or two years living in Montana and um, uh, you know it's very easy to uh, switch off here in Europe because you know the original inhabitants I mean who who are the original inhabitants my my lineage is is Irish mainly and um, (sighs) You know, we're we're so removed from anyone with any connection to land. I mean, there are people here whose families have been, you know, farming for generations or, you know, cutting peat or, you know, fishing and and that sort of thing. But um, when you go to North America, when I go back to, you know, not so much when I go back to Canada, because, yeah, that's a long story. I don't want to get into that. But um, certainly when I was in the American West, you know, the people who are connected to the land are there. They're vibrant and thriving and all around you. And um, it it just, it really makes it all the more vivid, the kind of the travesty of how First Nations people were deracinated from their culture and language. Um, And I I, I actually have found that very difficult um, to be around that 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 feeling of sorrow and i think that's partly why i was you know throughout the you know the research that i was doing that ended up becoming surrender and meeting people like phoenicia or meeting you know river reclaimers and ecosexuals and peter michael bauer and people who were sort of in my view doing good things and you know um M- michael ridge who's carrying on phoenicia's amazing uh, vision of, of living nomadically around the American West. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people doing amazing things. And I, I, I need I needed to know that, I think. Yeah, there are. I've, I, and like I said, I've met, you know, some of the some of the same ones. And there are I got to spend time with Phoenicia. I always called her granny. I always called her tranny granny myself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, well, I'm, well, I'm queer. And so to me, she really felt like a granny in that way. You know, yeah, yeah, she felt totally. like kin. And that way. so I yeah. always called her that, you know, you know, what, one thing that I thought was interesting that you talked about is you were talking about the preppers and the rewilders. And you said <laughs> that both of them uh, in your mind were looking to the past, sort of an idealized past, or you wouldn't use the word utopia, but I, I think I might, to say what was uh, inspiring them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think there is an element of perhaps nostalgia. It's very hard to uh, look to the future and feel hopeful in a sense and I think uh, humans we have a tendency particularly now with the sort of climate catastrophe to look to the past but I think the past that the preppers look back to is what I wouldn't particularly call the past they look back to um, a good past I think they look back and this is my opinion and I'm sure there'll be loads of people out there sort of shaking their fists at what I say but um, you know, people like the, the Hammonds or, um, uh, you know, who are the, the guys, that, the Bundys. You know, I think their idealized past is when Europeans ran roughshod over the West and could, you know, indiscriminately kill whatever they wanted and, you know, shoot whoever they wanted. And, and, and it was a free for all. And I think that's their idealized past. Whereas I feel that perhaps with some of the rewilders, their idealized past is maybe further back than that, like 10,000 years further back. You know, when we humans could were stewarding the land in a sustainable way. Um, and one of the things I really liked when I went to the ecosex convergence was I sort of felt that there was a feeling amongst so for people who don't know ecosexuality is it's a movement where people put their relationship to the land on par or above with their relationship with fellow humans. And I felt there was a kind of feeling of optimism 
in the movement, there was this feeling that, I don't know, maybe we can create something that we haven't seen before. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that chapter was, was, was really very interesting. That was the chapter where I knew the least about the subculture that you were talking about and didn't know any of the people who were involved. And you talked in there about the small exchange made clear to me that I had zero interest in interacting with this man. Oh, yeah, there was a man who... Uh, <laughs> There's a man who was like maybe hitting on you, I guess. You didn't put it right. that way, but but I guess that's what right. I meant. So right. I hadn't always been like this. I was rapacious in my 20s and 30s and led by sex. Boyfriends accused me of being a nymphomaniac. I was wild <laughs> and hungry for experience and had several boyfriends on the go at once. Being mm -hmm. sexually faithful is something that only happened when I had a child in my 40s. Sex for the sake of it has lost some of its appeal, and I am surprised by how comfortable I am with this new phase in my life. It feels more like a gain than a loss, more like a power than vulnerability. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, and I think, um, I, you know, again, I sort of think it's, well, certainly for me, I like this feeling that your life, that you go through different phases and different things are important to you at different times in your life. And uh, I've always been someone who's tried not to sort of fight that. You know, I sort of think of my body as a wild place, you know, and I don't really want to have to tame it. That's not to say that I'm, I'm like, if you were to meet me, I would look very normal. I don't have piercings and loads of tattoos and dyed hair. Um, I look like a very normal kind of middle class white woman, uh, but what's on the inside I think is is fairly wild in some ways. But um, but I think that's one of the reasons why I really liked the the title "Surrender" for the book because I think there's a real power in surrendering, and it doesn't mean giving up. A few people have sort of questioned or, you know, ask me about the title when I've talked about the book. And um, I, I think there's strength in knowing when to um, just acquiesce, just give yourself over to something. And to me, that's that's a strength. And yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm glad I'm not the, the way I was in my 20s. <laughs> I'm really pleased, actually. Um, it's a shame you and I didn't know each other in our 20s. We would have had some fun, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we, we would have been out on the town having such a great time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but funnily enough, uh, in the, the this is slightly off piece, but the, the one of the women who ran the Ecosex Convergence I was at is this woman called um, Terry Kiachi. And uh, amazing woman, and um, she's the person I do some ancestral channeling with. And she actually knew Phoenicia and her actually knew each other, funnily enough. Um, yeah, so there you go. All things connect eventually. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting. It must have been interesting for you reading that bit because, as you said, you didn't. It's not something you're so familiar with. Yeah, I mean, not not. Per, I mean, obviously, I'm not familiar with these different changes that that women experience, you know, obviously. And so I appreciated the fact that the menopause was a theme that kept coming back over and over again in the book, because it isn't something that's uh, treated very often in fiction or nonfiction, you know, you right. don't really see it in movies very much. I mean, maybe it comes up every once in a while in a television show or something, but I think yeah. that it's kind of ignored and that seems strange for what a significant thing it is. Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, after the book came out in the UK, um, I was commissioned to write an essay about menopause for an online magazine here called Un Unbound. Um, and it, 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 it and yeah, and it's now been picked up by someone who wants it in an anthology, and it's it's kind of taken off. And uh, I think it's partly because, you know, menopause is often treated as kind of like a joke, like oh my god, I've got my menopausal brain on today, and like oh I can't remember anything, I'm so ditzy, and you know, it, it's sort of treated as it's quite lightly, and actually it is, it's a seismic moment in a woman's life, and I think again you know, 
we're sort of taught to, to fight it. It's like, oh my God, my lick, my looks are going, you know, um, cause I'm in menopause and there's all, you know, it's all these negatives around it. And actually it is it, such a sort of wild ride. You know, you're raging, you're hot, it's your body's freaking out. I, I don't know. I think it's kind of fascinating to experience. I think it's great. <laughs> actually. <laughs> Well, you do bring that across really well in the, in the book. And so I, I thought that was, that was wonderful. But this phrase that you just used, you know, taught to fight, you know, well, aren't we taught to mm. fight nearly every natural urge that we have by this society? Right. right. I mean, isn't that right. kind of the point of patriarchy? It kind of seems like it, you know? Yes, I would, I would, uh, I would agree with that for sure. Um, and I'm, I mean, it's interesting being, the age that, that we are, you know, I, you know, we really remember the 80s um, and which had a lot of bad things, Thatcher and Reagan um, being two pretty yes. horrible things about the 80s and this sort of rapacious consumer culture, which I felt really took off in the 80s. But one thing that I thought was maybe better back then was this idea of sort of gender bending. And I think... Um, you know, th there was there was a sort of more fun around the fluidity of of what a woman could be, what a man could be. And I'm personally feeling at the moment that there's a lot more misogyny around. Um, and I think uh, there's a kind of strange authoritarianism that I feel is, is emerging in the on the left. Uh, and I just I wish that we could go back to having a bit being a bit more playful around things. And I, I don't know what, what has brought this on, but I'm, I'm feeling like people have just kind of forgotten to have fun. Maybe it's because the earth is dying and it's very hard to have fun if you're living on something that is essentially dying. I, I don't know. I don't have the answer, but it's something I think about. Yeah, well, I think that a lot has changed since the 80s, you know, in terms of the culture that's been... Uh, negative. I'll just say it, you know, I, because the Reagan was the and Thatcher were the beginning of the backlash against the openings of the 60s, you know, where right. let's right. try to close this up and put this back in the bottle. And, you know, Reagan had the assistance of AIDS, you know, as well. Right. right? You know, that, that came along. So, oh, here's an excuse to really, you know, right. clamp down on these people, you know, and so. You know, and, and that's a whole other story of what that was like to sort of come of age sexually as AIDS right. was coming onto the scene. That's that's a whole other thing. But I, I right. to me, you know, at that time, at the beginning of the 80s, it felt as though we were entering a dark tunnel. And uh -huh. to me, it feels as though we never left that tunnel, that we're still in it. You know, that's right. the sensation I had, you know. And right. so if things do seem... Uh, darker or more bleak, you know, it's because I, well, I think that they just have been, you know, they are, yeah. you know, that's yeah. just within, within the, the, the culture. And maybe that has something to do with the cycles of empires and, 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 and how they mm -hmm. decline and all that. But then, yes, there's also the point that the earth is dying and there are these cries for help that mm. are being emitted by all sorts of creatures, you know, animals, right. plants, more, you know, and, and, and these voices are in the air all the time. And there is yeah. some part of us which is picking up on it, which does yeah. hear them. But because we're not trained to pick up right. on them by our culture, we don't right. even know what we're, we don't even know that we're hearing something. We don't know how to listen right. for it. And then we certainly don't know how to respond. Right, right. Right. I totally agree with that. And I think, um, yeah, I think uh, I, you know, it's funny. I don't know if you find this being a writer, Calibri, but when you're writing stuff and you're processing it and you're thinking about it, there's this idea that, you know, we should try and come up with an answer. And I think uh, it's, I realized when I was writing Surrender that, oh, you know, I'm just one person and I have, you know, ideas about, things we should be doing um, that we're not, but um, that, you know, the, the answer to our existential crisis of this, of this age, which is climate breakdown, catastrophe, whatever you want to call it, the, the dying of the earth. Um, and the answers are myriad. There are so many answers. And um, 
I, I stop sort of trying to be this person who can answer them in her writing. Like I just, what I try and do is, is isolate a, a problem, look at it from as many angles as I can, and then just try and get that out there and hope that some people might read it and it might change their consciousness on some level or just maybe change a little bit how they might look at the earth. Um, but it's 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 today today is has been a bad day I just, there's just some days i don't know if you find this where you just think oh my god there's so much plastic in those oceans the nanoparticles are everywhere and i think i mentioned this in the book maybe i don't mention it in surrender but my sort of big epiphany in terms of the earth was when i was probably about 12 and i was in a doctor's office and i picked up a national geographic and i read that there was, I think it was DDT, uh, or it was certainly a chemical was found in the, had just been found in the breast milk of polar bears. And I just remember thinking, that's it. We're fucked. Like, that's it. You know, we've, we've done it. You know, we've poisoned the breast milk of polar bears. Like, you know, um, and I'm having one of those days today. <laughs> I just think we're fucked. Uh, and then, you know, and then, but then yesterday I was reading about Winona LaDuke and the amazing stuff she's doing. And it's like, okay, I just need to sort of tune into, if I was a radio, just change the channel, tune into some good stuff because there is good stuff. And uh, I guess it's just this constant, like up and down, up and down. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I, I certainly do. Yeah, I definitely have those same experiences. And as for, uh, feeling the pressure to come up with an answer, you know, as a writer, I do feel that too. And there's just those people who are like, well, you can't mention a problem unless you come up with a solution. And I, yeah. I've, I have also come to feel that that's, that's um, ridiculous and that it's on, it's not necessary for me to also try to provide an answer. And I've also been wondering if that isn't part of the hubris of our culture, right? right? right. That, that, exactly. that we feel like we even could, it's like, well, right. Don't we have a track record going back about 10,000 years showing that we don't fucking know what we're doing? Right. So I totally agree. And it makes me think, I don't know if you've ever read um, that book. Oh, what's it called? Oh, I can't remember now. It's a book about a guy who goes to Japan to learn how to shoot an arrow. And uh, there's this old Japanese skill of archery and the, it, you spend years and years and years not looking at the target. Like there's no target until you're basically a master of this arrow. And then you get to look at the target. And I just think that's such a great metaphor. And I tell that to my students, you know, with writing, it's like, don't look at the target. You know, you're not, you can't, I don't know. I think it's a very Western way of looking at things of like, Here's a problem and now we're going to solve it. And actually, sometimes you just need to walk around the problem, sit with the problem, examine the problem and answers will emerge. Uh, and I totally agree with you. I think in a way that's it's almost part of the problem is, is the way we think about these things for sure. Well, and certainly I feel that as a writer, part of the reason that I will bring up something is because someone else once they're aware that that's the situation could be like, Oh, Hey, how about this? You right. know, because right. that happens in everyday situations. If you're in a group of people and you're right. trying to figure something out, you know, you put it out there and then sometimes someone will say something. Well, I never would have thought of that. I never ever would have come up with that given a hundred years. And yet just, it just came off the top of this person's head. And so, you know, it's an unrealistic expectation that one person, you know, should be able to do any everything. And I also think that it's an unrealistic expectation that one culture should be able to do everything. And so it was really fitting. I thought that you mentioned paying attention to Winona LaDuke because I feel like that's one of the things that we should be working on at this point. And when I say we, I mean the dominant culture, right, is, is paying attention to what people who are not in the dominant culture have to say. Right. Right. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I think for me, writing, writing is about having conversations. And I think, again, it's sort of it all ties into this way of, of looking at the world and thinking about the world. And um, it's been very interesting for me having a book 
you know, published in the UK, published in the US. Um, it's being translated into a few different languages. And I certainly don't feel in any way that like I've arrived or like I'm a writer now. I just feel like maybe I've opened up the conversation a little bit more amongst people who maybe weren't having that conversation, but I definitely don't feel, um, yeah, that it's my place or whatever to kind of tell people what to do or how to think, but to, to have conversations. Absolutely. And that's, that's why I do what I do really. And I remember the name of the book. It's Zen and the art of archery. It's huh. a brilliant book. Anyway, lovely, beautiful book. Sorry, I, I feel like I've vented a bit there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of, of course you're going to vent a little bit. I mean, it's just, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's just part of it, you know, for, for, for all of us at this point, I think, you know. Uh, you know, there was an interesting thing you wrote about um, the eco-sex gathering where you said you were talking about the um, young people at the gathering. And you said, mm -hmm. like many of the 20-somethings I spoke mm -hmm. with at Surrender, this person held two opposing ideas in his head that there may not be a livable planet in his lifetime and that he wants to have a productive life in spite of this. These are ideas mm -hmm. I did not have to grapple with in my twenties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was very aware, as I said, you know, from a young age about the environment, but certainly when I was growing up, I thought, okay, we are fucked, but there was definitely this idea. There is hope like, we can get together and we can stop what we're doing. And, you know, and then the EPA came in in the seventies and um, so the, the clean water act and the clean air act, um, you know, under Nixon. And that was, you know, okay, people are taking this seriously. Oh my God. The, even the American government is taking this seriously. So, yeah, I, I think growing up, I did feel hope. And I think back to if I were 20 now or 25 now, I think it would be really difficult to to have hope that there's a productive life ahead of you with the um, decay of this planet the way it is. And and I I was you know I'm amazed I was amazed at some of the young people I sound so old but some of the young people I met at the Ecosex Convergence because I really felt they were really searching in the right places and trying to create communities. Um, and trying to be positive and doing good things, um, you know, with this awareness. And I just, yeah, my hat's off to them, you know? Yeah, and it's just much different trying to find a community for the people in their 20s now, too, because when we were in our 20s, um, all over the United States and Canada and Europe, it was possible to live cheaply mm. in cities, yeah. you know? Right. Like right. that's that's where it was cheap to live. You know, you right. could go and totally. you could go furnish your your apartment off of stuff you found out on the street. Yep. You know, totally. you know, yep. I, I remember some of the furniture I had in Minneapolis in the 90s. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that was really nice stuff. But it was just something from the curb, you know, totally. like yep. like. And so the fact that um, the young people don't have the cities anymore. No. That's just so sad because at least we had that. We could gather, you know? Totally. And we all lived for nothing. I mean, really, I moved to London in 1990. I mean, the house I'm in now, a lot of this furniture has been, I mean, it's all from the garbage. Pretty much everything was either given to me or from the garbage. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I wonder though if, Maybe it's cheaper in these sort of weird hinterlands between city and country. I mean, I'm, they're, they've got to be sort of sort of groups of young people gathering and living lives, um, doing it cheaply and being brilliant and creative. I'm sure that's it's got to be going on somewhere. I just I'm probably too old to know where it's happening. <laughs> Well, I think the other thing that's happening now is that so much social interaction or ideas about social interaction mm -hmm. is now taking place online. Right. And that, I think, is a huge problem. I really, really do. I think the whole, I think social media is, uh, I don't think it's being helpful to the conversations that I feel we need to have around social justice, around climate justice. I, 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 I worry about that, I have to say. 
I think that on balance, it does more harm than good. Mm, I would agree with that. Um, and I don't know what to do about that. I mean, I have a teenager. She's 13. And, you know, she wants to get onto social media and stuff. And I just think, oh, my God, all the values I've taught her, you know, don't jump to conclusions about anyone. Um, do your research. If someone spreads a rumor, don't necessarily believe it. Go back to the source. Check if it's true. Uh, be kind. <laughs> uh, be respectful. No ad hominem attacks. If you don't agree with someone and, you know, walk away unless they're being, you know, actively hateful, then you can step in. But do so respectfully. All those things. I mean, maybe I'm wrong to be teaching those, but I feel those are important things. And then you go on Twitter or you go on social media and all of that falls apart, you know, Um and uh, yeah, I think it's a terrifying landscape. And I, I think it's uh, there's a kind of like mob rule uh, that I feel is taking over a little bit, that it isn't healthy. But, you know, that's that's just me. Well, it's also a for profit landscape. Right. Right. It's not uh, the public in the same way that right. the street or a park, right. or right. even a bar is, you know? Right, right, right. Or like someone's, you know, squat. We had that. We had these, like, spaces that were not surveyed, that were not kind of on the map, that were usually free and quite communal. Um, and, uh, yeah, the Internet is the opposite of that as you say it's monetized and it's it's yeah it's a private enterprise isn't it making money from our data basically yeah and that's always going to be there in the background and they're going to make sure that that's what it always stays best at and they're continually honing that to make it effective in that way above all and so anything else that uh you might be looking to it for such as a source of information about current events or whatever is is going to be secondary and as we know it's a lot of it is censored now of course too and a lot of it is right. censored not even by human beings but by algorithms right <laughs> it's just absurd the whole thing how have we got here i mean I, lately, I've been just thinking more and more and more. Like, and it's one of the things I, uh, you know, I really miss living out in the West. And you know, we returned to the UK, and in in retrospect, I think it was a it was a bad move. I mean, I know the US is rife with problems at the moment. Where isn't? But yeah, I mean, but the space and the um, I don't know. I think there are some pretty healthy communities out there. And I think that having space in which to think and create and make work, which we just don't have here in London. I mean, I'm just surrounded by concrete and uh, it's, I'm finding it quite hard to, to think, really. Yeah. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Well, the cities have gotten more intense over time, right. you know, as well. Like, I have a friend in Portland who's a bit older than us. She's in her mid-60s, I believe. And she's lived in Portland her entire life, you know. And she lives rather close in towards the towards the middle and in one of the older neighborhoods uh, across the street from where she grew up, in fact. I mean, this is something... Mm. Not 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 many people can even say things like that anymore these right. days, right? You know, right. but but yeah. she did right. And so, well, when the shutdown was at its peak about a month ago, or a couple months ago, you know, because of the the pandemic, you know, and there was so little traffic on the street, she says, "Oh, this reminds me of Portland in the '60s," you know. Mm. Yeah. When it was just a lot more quiet, a lot more mellow, a lot yeah. less traffic, and it's like, yeah. well, that's partly what's been happening too is that the cities have become uh, more intense totally totally and i mean on the one hand i mean one of the things i do like about living in a city is that you know you don't need a car i mean we don't really use petrol in our lives 
you know um we do we have a, a boiler so when we you know turn on the hot water a boiler goes on and that that does use petrol but ultimately you can I, I just I think there are ways of living in a very environmental way in cities whereas you know if we lived out in the countryside here we'd need a car we'd have to like shop in a supermarket unless we were growing all our own food which you know who can buy land in the UK uh no one and um yeah so and as you know I love your posts that you you put up with your trials and tribulations and successes of growing things and, you know, living on your own, trying to grow all your own food is incredibly challenging. Uh, you know, yes. we do need each other. We can't, we are not islands. And I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it is possible to be in a, in a fairly environmental community in the city, but I think that's getting harder now as well. Just because of the real estate, if if nothing else, and I've read right. enough about London to know that that's one of the places where it's been the worst. Yeah, it's crazy. It's really crazy. And, you know, people sort of, you know, our neighborhood, which was like super like poor, cheap, uh, run down. I mean, parts of it still are, but more and more people are moving here with money. And what happens is the whole fabric and I've watched it happen. The fabric falls apart because the sort of people that are moving in or sending their children sort of to private school. So they're not like mixing with all the local kids on the street. And and you just it's interesting watching an area kind of fray around the edges and you just see how that just causes it to fall apart, you know, um, and leads to people living these much more sort of isolated lives where, you know, you drive the kids to school far away to the private school and then when they want play dates you know you have to drive to, to other people's houses you know whereas you know how we've done it and how you know a lot of people used to do it your kid goes to the local school they meet up with their friends after school in the local park there are no cars involved no no planning involved and it's just this organic way of living which even in cities feels like that is that's the whole point of being in a city you know um and people don't seem to see that. It's so strange. But again, I sometimes think, you know, maybe I'm just old and I just have different, I don't know, my, my, the way I look at the world feels very much not, uh, not au courant. It's not how people want to look at the world a lot of the time, I think. Well, there's been a decline in community and community ties mm. in cities that one can look at, you know, just mm. as an historical trend, mm. you know, uh, with sort of the maybe the peak uh, in American cities anyway, being uh, when you had the ethnic neighborhoods that were really strong. Well, probably the 40s was really sort of the peak, because what started to happen in the 50s and the 60s was the big, great suburban build out. And then. Right. The in the United States, you had the urban renewal where they came in and were like tearing down old neighborhoods, you know, and where they were shoving the uh, interstate highway systems through, you know. So like there's there's the famous example of the West End in Boston, which was like this close knit immigrant neighborhood, you know, it was Irish, wasn't it? I, I believe it was Irish. Yes. Yeah. So maybe maybe you've, you've heard of it. Right. And so, you know, a, a tremendous number of people living in, you know, three and four story brick walk ups, you know what I mean? Just like tenement housing, yeah. you know just jammed in there and what they did was they demolished basically the entire neighborhood you know flattened it you know yeah. to build a new government center and then all of those people they all got new housing in like towers and whatever like scattered around well there's all those universities in boston so so one of them uh followed the people and what they found was that there was these high levels of depression of suicide right. people were less right. successful so you know they came in and took a good thing and wrecked it you know and see that happened really fast that happened over the course of like a year or whatever that they came in with wrecking balls and then you know, and right. then over the years later, they found out that people were doing badly. But there's been kind of a slow motion wrecking ball. That's what gentrification right. really has been, right. you know, because because right. the 90s was really the last time it was easy to live in U.S. Yeah. cities. Right. Right. You know, and, and so, here. yeah. And so and so it's not just that, you know, we're pining for the good old days. And that's just us wishing that things were the way they were that we're used to, it's like, well, no, actually, uh, there actually was more community then. There were yeah. more of those things happening. Like, like 
uh, extended families were living closer together. Children were playing on the streets together, all those things, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think community, it, it, you know, comes back to sort of what we were saying before, this idea that, um, oh, that, you know, with, with this sort of need to be dominant, you know, of sort of allowing someone to go, oh, we're just going to like tear down that neighborhood and we're going to move them all. I mean, who whoever thinks that doing something like that is a good idea? I mean, there were slum clearances here that I think were quite successful, like in the sort of 1900s, or, you know, 1910, sort of around then. Um, but that's a slightly different thing because I, that was done for sort of civic reasons. The intention behind it was very different. I don't think it was done to make money, <laughs> um, you know. And again, you know, money is so, or not money, the, the sort of desire for money is such a destructive force and and again it sort of comes back to how we treat the land i mean we've monetized the earth we've monetized the soil and how do we come back from that how do we sever this mindset of seeing everything in terms of profit um i, I just don't know how we do that you know but in surrender it's surrender is kind of a tour in a way of some people who are addressing those very questions. Right. 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 Absolutely. I guess it's just, it's, I mean, I'm glad I wrote it before. Well, I finished it when Trump got in. And so there are a couple of mentions of Trump in the book, but I, I'm kind of glad in a way that it's a sort of snapshot of that time pre Trump. Um, and, uh, because I think it's very hard to write in a in a sort of calm, cool and collected way that really that I think is sometimes necessary for a certain type of reportage uh, with Trump in power. I find it very hard to not get completely emotional and despairing because I just can't see one positive or good thing coming out of his administration right now. It's just pure destruction. Um, and so, yeah, I'm glad I wrote Surrender when I did. And it'll be interesting. I have ideas for, like, the next sort of book. And um, I think it's going to focus more on cities, interestingly, that we've been talking about cities. Um, and, yeah, I'm not sure how how I'm going to do it, really. But I'm sort of thinking about that a little bit. How do we, how do we create built environments? Um, that aren't destructive. I almost feel like the beginning of the answer to that has to start with taking the profit motive out of it. Right. Right. Because trying to, to make money and trying to do well by the limited resources of the earth are in conflict with one another. Right. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, it's kind of a big question, but it's something that really because you know more and more people are moving to cities when you look at you know countries around the world uh you know rural parts of the world wild parts of the world are literally just being seen as bread baskets um gold mines copper mine you know they're just seen as things that we can just extract from and as this happens more and more and more and more people are moving to cities and and i see that as a bit of a as a bit of an issue, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, I think <laughs> to that. To put it mildly. Yeah, I think that, that your book is very important in that it is something that people who live in cities all the time can read and be like, oh, look at all this stuff that's going on out there in the world that I'm not aware of living here in the right. city. Right. Right. And I, I, you know, even, you know, friends of mine in New York, you know, they call, you know, the West like flyover country. And it's like, fuck you. Sorry. Like, Pardon my language, but, you know, this is this whole idea of um, these deserts being somehow like just places you fly over. I just I find that offensive. You know, um, th those swaths of the West are so rich in history and people and animals and plants. And um, yeah, actually, I've, you know, as I get older and I, I sometimes think. You know, I'm getting more and more, I want to live much closer to the earth 
uh, you know, as much as I can. And as I get older, it feels like a much stronger pull. And I think partly because I'm getting closer to the time when I will be dust myself. And I want to really uh, connect with it and, and almost like ask its forgiveness. Because, you know, I've lived in cities. I haven't given back to the earth nearly as much as, you know, people like Phoenicia or probably yourself, you know. And I, I feel bad about that. Yeah, I feel very similar ways about about all of that. And I, the the worst things get, the more I feel like I need to be getting serious about mm -hmm. about how it is that I need to to give back, how it is that I can. But I'm very grateful, you know, definitely to be living in the western part of the United States, just because it's wonderful to get to know these places and to get right. to know what's happening in these places. And, you know, there's mainstream environmentalists who are like, Oh, look at that desert. You know, let's just fill that up with solar panels, you know? Right. And it's right. like, wow, you know, you have no yeah. idea what a monstrous thing that is to say. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I, I have some friends who live on the East Coast and who live in East Coast cities and no offense to them. But most of the people who live in East Coast cities in the United States are fucking clueless. You know, <laughs> they've got no idea what's happening out here. They think the whole world revolves around them and they're like fancy cities and like, you know, everyone out West is just a little bit stupid or a little bit, you know, silly or, or whatever it is. And they just kind of. You know, they just they really just do think that they're all that. And wow, it just gets to be a little annoying. You know, I mean, a lot yeah. of my writing is is a lot of my writing is really focused on trying to alert the city people to what's going on outside the cities, right. you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I think that's one of the divides that I see. And again, it's sort of you see it magnified on social media, you know, people who, yeah, are sort of. uh Again, it comes back to human exceptionalism. You know, if you live in a built environment and, you you know, um, and you see all the amazing things that man has made and these skyscrapers and look at those amazing suspension bridges and, and you, you sort of you forget that actually uh, we are hewn from the land. You know, we are just little hunks of nature, um, you know. And yeah, New Mexico, I love, by the way, I just have to register that. I absolutely love New Mexico. Oh my God, I have had some amazing experiences there. It's a beautiful part of the world. But are you struggling with the dryness? Because that's one of the things about the West that I, that I worry about so much is the, the, the droughts and dryness and increased, you know, aquifers running out and clean water, um, and, you know, irrigation for food is, is one of the things that keeps me awake at night. I just uh, I just find it so insane that we are filling our fresh waterways with poison. Like, I just find it insane. Yeah. And then using a vast amount of water for manufacturing things, too. Right. 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 And and also, I think they've stopped it now, but um, they used to server farms, you know, where all our data is being stored. They used to have 24 hour a day massive sprinklers to keep them cool. Yeah. Again, fresh water, you know. Now they've started building them in places like Iceland, even though, you know, those places are now melting, too. But, um, yeah, our, our, it just everything just seems... So not, I mean, it always has. I've never, the world has never really made sense to me ever. Um, but it seems to be making less sense. But I, I think my, my dream is to live amongst more people who make more sense to me. That's, that's my life goal, Calibri. <laughs> yeah, that would be mine too. And I'm not exactly sure how that's going to happen, you know? <laughs> Same here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope we get to meet. Maybe it will involve living in some community somewhere in the West. Who knows? Yeah, that would but, be lovely. That, that would be lovely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 You wrote, um, the West is one of the last places on Earth where thoughts around wilderness as inoculation against the darker forces of modernity are still in the ether, in the discourse, in people's decisions to live off the grid, on the land, in the hoop. For the first time in my life, I was begin beginning to understand the West and its promise, real and imagined, of freedom, escape, transcendence, and its promise to turn us from predator to prey. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
That sounded quite good, actually. When you read it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really nice, especially the real and imagined part, because as you keep coming back to over and over again in the book, there's the illusions that people have. Uh, like the Bundys and, and the, would be sort of the more extreme example of that, that, oh, the West is just there to go out and to be free to use it up, you know? Right. And then right. there's the then there's the ways of thinking about it where, well, no, it's 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 a place that's that that's free to uh, escape society more. Right. Right. I think what what really struck me, I mean, this idea of freedom that is in the air in particularly in the American West is not, it's not in the air in Europe. I mean, this idea of freedom doesn't really exist here. I think, I think we, we sort of uh, chose, I mean, certainly in the UK, we've got, you know, a sort of um, vaguely socialist democracy. Um, You know, no one's going to really, it's quite, I mean, you can, yeah, there are safety nets here and free health care and, you know, some good socialized things going on. But it is ultimately a sort of capitalist sort of democracy. Um, but people don't really talk about freedom. And it was really striking to me being in living in the West and how I feel like people are still working out there. What does freedom mean? And I find that actually quite an exciting thought to have. And it's one of the things I really like about the States and I like about the West is that uh, it feels like it's still kind of a work in progress. I, I, that's quite an exciting uh, feeling, really. Yeah. You, know? you, you made another observation where you said, in the West, I was beginning to see the right and the left were constantly overlapping in unexpected ways to the point where political positions were often blurred. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we met sort of really sort of right wing. um, Oh, hang on. Let me just. There we go. Uh, Quite, quite extreme right wing kind of bunker type people. Uh, Actually, I think I may even mention it a little bit when we, we went out and met with the three presenters of Idaho who were very kind of, I would say, politically on the right and so on. But a lot of them were really anti-GM, anti-corporation. Uh, it was quite interesting. Whereas, you know, I find here in the UK, you know, someone will read the Guardian newspaper and that pretty much tells you, you know, how they vote and kind of, you know, what they think, and what they believe. Whereas I found in the US, certainly in the West, that actually the lines were not as uh, not as straight and, and, and clear. And again, I found that really interesting. Yeah. There's an overlap between, uh, libertarians and and left wings like, uh, and and I, one place I don't think you spent much time was, um, uh, Northern California. And I, I spent, yeah, I spent a bit of time working there on the cannabis farms and that was a lot of hippie rednecks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, so there was definitely just this hybrid there. Where it was like, oh, they're rednecks and they're hippies, both. You know, right? And and so there's the being for organics, being against genetically modified, you know, food, as you said, like being anti corporate, being you know in favor of, of freedom, you know, personal freedom, etc. You know, but one thing that I found uh, that really were mostly the same about most of the people on the right and left was a kind of in this search for freedom is ignoring the fact that uh, we're on stolen land here. Right. To me, yeah. that that changes the entire conversation. It's like, well, how can we right. talk about uh, right. how to use these things which aren't even ours? Right. That's uh, yeah. I, for me, that's definitely uh, like a sort of deal breaker. <laughs> you know, if you mention that to someone and they basically tell you to get a life and grow up, then I sort of think, uh, yeah, maybe we don't have a lot more to talk about here. Um, you know, because I think that is that's a huge that's a crux. And, you know, it's been interesting with the Black Lives Matter movement that's really kind of emerging, um, you know, quite vocally at the moment, which is great. 
Um, and, you know, I can remember back to the Native American movement of the 70s. And actually my sister, one of my sisters, I'm the youngest of seven. One of my sisters married a First Nations guy. And, you know, um, I was very close to his sister. And, and, and you know, that he became a very big part of our family and his family and our family. And uh, I really remember that 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 emerging Native American movement. And where's it gone? You know, I keep thinking, oh, my God, you know, every time, you know, I don't know more. I mean, there are these movements, but I just feel like for some reason, like the global consciousness is not is not ready to uh, embrace the indi an indigenous mo global movement. You know, and I don't know why. Maybe it's just too big. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, well, I think it gets to the heart of of everything. Right. You know, we, we have to question everything at that point. It's like we have to question right. where our houses are built. We have to question right. where, you know, the resources come for right. everything that we're wearing and everything that we're using, you know, right. and, and for a lot of what we're eating. I mean, it's just yeah. it, it's. You know, it's huge. Yeah, and of course, they're the they're the people who who have the real knowledge. I mean, there was there was a right. there was a a famous quotation from the from the nineties. There was a, a United Nations had a gathering of indigenous people, and there was a speaker there who said, "We represent you know like one percent of the world's population, but we represent over ninety nine percent of the knowledge of how to live right. with the planet sustainably right so I think right. that you know yeah. for for most people in civilized places, whether they would admit to it out loud or not, they would just kind of prefer if those people would just kind of disappear i mean it's it i I find it really shocking and i just don't really understand why yeah i think i think it would probably undermine so many people's sort of livelihoods and lifestyles i hate the word lifestyle but there you go you know to ad admit all this and to see it to see it not even admit it but just to see it and a friend of mine who writes about issues in um amongst indigenous people in brazil and she used the term walking libraries and, you know, a lot of these people um, are dying from COVID. There's a serious problem amongst indigenous people in um, in uh, Latin America and South America, particularly in Brazil. And a lot of the people with the knowledge are, are dying, sadly, from COVID. And, you know, I just find that I find that devastating. I just find it completely devastating. And um you know, again, what does one do with those feelings of devastation? You know, here I am in London, you know, I have enough food to eat. You know, we, we get by. We're not rich, but we basically just about get by. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people feel this. There's this sort of feeling of, you know, what, how can I stop this from happening? You know, um, is it because we're know. too are we too polite? Maybe, maybe, or or have the tentacles of capitalism been so effective at sort of um, ripping us away from the sources, from the from the important things uh, that we no longer feel we can make a difference. We no longer feel empowered in that way. Um, I don't know. I'm sort of asking it like as a big question, not necessarily to get an answer, but just as something that like this is this. Yeah, this keeps me awake at night. Well, because, you know, Granny would say the young people, they don't even know what they are missing. Right. <laughs> totally. Totally. We don't yeah. know what we've lost. Right. And she was all about, you know, telling us, you know, what ecocidal motherfuckers we were for not doing oh, yeah. anything about it. And she was right. She was right. Of course she was right. And that was one of the things I loved about her was that, yeah, I mean, she wasn't polite and yeah, she was complicated. Like, you know, I'm not, she was no saint, our Phoenicia, but, um, but, oh my God, she completely opened my eyes to so much and uh, did, did so for so many people 
And uh, I think this comes back to what we were talking where you mentioned, you know, the word appropriation. And I know I have heard people sort of slag her off for sort of, you know, appropriating native ways and so on. And I think the thing is, it's a very tricky place because if you're living in a land where there are certain ways of living that benefit the land, then I think you should do those things and live in that way. Now, if those ways also happen to be the ways that the original inhabitants of the land also lived, I don't I don't see that as cultural appropriation. I see that as people wisening up to the best way of stewarding a land. And I, I get quite, I, I think it's quite frustrating sometimes entering conversations that, that go in that direction. Right. Well, I think that there's, there's a tendency towards perfectionism, you know, in, in Western culture, it's related to our utopianism, you know? And so it's like, oh, if you can't just do something absolutely perfectly and right, then you shouldn't be doing it. And so I think that a lot of critiques come from that point of view. And those critiques are not helpful because there's nowhere to start, you know? Right. And I also had a, I also have a friend, um, he, I did an earlier podcast with him. You could look it up, uh, Randy Woodley. He's a Cherokee and he's, uh, also a college professor and a farmer. And he talked about, uh, on the topic of appropriation and this and that, he talked about how it's not just actions, but values and that the uh -huh. values that Native Americans and Native American cultures have that that's the foundation of the actions. And so he was seeing that there could be uh, appropriation where an action was taken without the values. Right. That to me, that is appropriation. But what I mean, I've, I've it's funny because I've explained this, you know, when I was living in Missoula and people would sort of question people like Benicia, what have you. And I, when your starting point is the earth, when your starting point is the rivers and the land and how to live in harmony with them and how to live in a way that, that allows for their abundance to, to thrive, then I just don't see how it can be. Yeah, I guess it's the intention how that can be seen as appropriation when really, you know, you're perhaps maybe learning from people who, are, who know things, um, but you're also... Your, your goal is ultimately the same. And actually, there was a wonderful piece in High Country News. I was just reading, actually, while I was waiting for you to, to, to call me um, about uh, why, um, in Washington state and how there's a sort of uh, federal people and uh, tribal people have come together to, to protect them. And it's a sort of happy story. It's great. You know, more of this, please. You know, and that's not appropriation. That's OK. How do we save these people, these people, these animals? I see them as people practically, but I, well, I do really, um, you know, and, and I think we, we're at a point, we're at a crisis point. And I don't think we've really got time to worry about some of this stuff. I think we just have to do it uh, for the right reasons. But, yeah, yeah. No, I totally, I totally agree with that. When, when time is running out, there's a little less time to be academic about things. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. You know, one other thing you wrote in Surrender uh, uh, related to this is, I do not come from one land, I come from many, which makes this nativist idea of being connected to a place problematic. I am mm -hmm. torn between finding my place and not believing that such a thing even exists. Yeah, that's the bane of my life, basically. That is the bane of my life. And uh, growing up in the suburbs, I never felt connected to land. Um, and I think it's actually horrible um, that, that so many people from the North American suburbs grew up on this stolen land, um, full of history, full of natural history and human history. And I was never taught it. And and I think it, it's, yeah, it's a kind of tragedy. Um, and so I'm looking, and I, I used to have good chats with Phoenicia about it. And I, you know, I said to her, I think I come from a bog in Ireland. Like, I think I'm a bog dweller. 
And she's like, yeah, you look like a bog dweller. And we used to joke, she'd say, have you found your bog yet? And I'm like, no, I haven't found my bog yet. Um, and, you know, I think there are things in the way right now, you know, I have a teenager and she really likes the city and I don't want to uproot her. And there are sort of personal things going on in life. And I don't see myself in London forever. And, but finding one's place when you don't really come from a place, I just find that a really difficult conundrum. And I think other people probably do too. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. I mean, I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska, you know? Right. Like I, you know, got away from there as soon as I could, you know, and go back as infrequently as possible, you know? Like I just... (laughs) It, it, it strikes me that we probably have similar feelings about yep. the places that we were they were born, right? So then, right. yeah, and well, my home countries, if you want to put it that way, you know, well, Norway's not taking me back. I'm 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 fifth generation over here now. Like they've got, right. you know, they're not going to touch me. I mean, what am I supposed to do? You know, so right. I, I totally hear you. And you also wrote the call to home. Then is as much about one's closeness to the earth and the pull towards the land of one's ancestors as it is about our mind's work, the people we meet, the place where things align to tell us we belong. Right. Right. Because I, I, I don't, I mean, this sort of pure, pure idea of, you know, if one is from, you know, a little patch in Suffolk that one must stay in one's little patch in Suffolk and, you know, all that. I, 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 I sort of, uh, bark at that a little bit I, I sort of uh, I think that that can sometimes come with a wrapping of a kind of xenophobic um, mindset that that doesn't sit comfortably with me having said that I think being connected to land is a marvelous wonderful thing I guess I'm searching for the place where the connection feels untroubled and feels somehow right and I think I did feel that somewhat in the West. There were places that we went where I just thought, yeah, I feel really, this feels really good. And yet, you know, I sort of think, eh, is that just sort of hippy dippy stuff? You know, wh- wh- do I have the right to settle? So I don't know. It, it, it all feels very complicated to me. And um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the whole topic of being sedentary is is problematic right i think you yeah right it feels problematic to me ultimately and i used to joke i mean i moved around so much when i was younger and my friends used to sort of joke that i was essentially a gypsy and i think there is a lot of that in me and i i i find the idea of picking a place and staying there quite difficult and yet I feel like I don't have the skills to live a proper nomadic life. I look at, you know, people like Michael Ridge and I just, my jaw is on the ground. I am in awe of, you know, what some, how some people are living um, nomadically and, and doing it so beautifully. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the life that was led before, you know, in the American West was, okay, we're, we're in this place at this time of year, you know, here we are for winter. Okay. Here we are for berry camp. Okay. At this time of year. Okay. Now here we are to pick pine nuts or to catch salmon or whatever. Right. And so there was a natural movement from place to place because that's when these things were there. I don't want to say when those resources were available because (laughs) resource is a a modern concept, you know, but, but Mm -hmm. they were there because that's what was going on in that area. So then you compare and in your, and in surrender, you mention all these little towns you know, that you go to. And, you know, a lot of them are run down to one degree or another, or they don't have jobs there anymore. Because in a way, what they did, you know, by going and mining all this copper in this place until the copper was gone. And then, and then, and then the town sort of goes into a decline. It's like, well, yeah, because that's kind of like staying at berry camp after there aren't any berries anymore, you know, with the exception that if you were to have a berry camp the same way that, you know, the, the Europeans do things, well, you'd be destroying all the berry plants, 
you know, right. once and for all as you harvested right. them and then poisoning the ground so no more berries could grow there. That would be – and then staying there and being like, oh, now there's nothing to do. Oh, I need jobs. Right. You know, it's like, well <laughs> – Right. I mean, that's the thing. I think ultimately the society that I was born into is ultimately a, a very schizophrenic, hypocritical society based on – lies and fictions that are really deeply unhelpful and I guess you know part of writing surrender was my was me trying to work out like a way of um remaining sane or uh yeah just working through this stuff not in, so much in a therapeutic way maybe there was an element of that but just more in a yeah, in a, in a deep personal way of how, you know, I think a lot of people, how can I live well on this earth? I think it's a really basic question that I think a lot of people ask. And uh, I think we all have to find our own answers for it. But and hopefully some people reading Surrender will find some answers uh, for themselves. But, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's it's a. We've done so much damage, it's going to be hard for us to come back from what we've done, I think. Yeah, I've got no clue how that can even happen. Right. Right. And I think maybe it's going to happen in pockets. You know, there'll be pockets where people have managed to steward the land or what have you. Um, you know, and, and maybe there'll be pockets that are just total and utter devastation that are completely unlivable upon and then there'll be pockets that aren't and maybe that's what the future is going to look like uh who knows and this whole thing of going to mars i just cannot i just <laughs> I just <laughs> cannot fathom why anyone thinks that's a brilliant idea but i know mean, that's another conversation <laughs> no, i mean i think that's a very short conversation it's just that won't work <laughs> Right. Because where is the energy going to come from that you're going to need to power everything? Why is no one talking about that? <laughs> yeah, well, we don't really want to talk about any of the important things here is, is right. generally my my impression. And that's right. why I found, you know, your book so refreshing, because it really seemed like the, the book is about someone who's reaching for that, who's grasping for that, who's looking for right. that, you know. Right. And, and so it almost reads like like fiction you know to me and that there was a oh i'm being pulled along and i'm like really care about this narrator and i'm i'm oh what's going to happen next i had that sense to it and so and that's that's what made it so easy to just pick it up and not want to put it down was because i just got pulled you know through it and so i was really inspired uh, uh by it you know as a writer it just is and that it was crafted so well and then also as someone who's been thinking about all of these exact same topics and writing about them it was just like wow this is this is this is great and so um i really appreciate that we had a chance to talk about the book today oh thank you so it means a lot especially you know i didn't get to do my u.s book tour i was i had this whole book tour that my publisher was going to send me on i was going to do some readings and particularly I was looking forward to reading in Missoula where I have such dear friends where I wrote the book. Um, and I really, really, really wanted to bring it back to the communities that actually like helped me make it, you know, and I haven't been able to do that. So what you just said is so, um, means a lot to me, Calibri, it really does. And having people in that land who know it more than I know it, reading it, and and you know understanding that I'm not I'm not claiming it I'm just asking questions that emerged for me around it um, so yeah thank you for coming to it with such a, an open spirit. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, 
visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.